results from a wake steering experiment at a commercial wind plant. And this is a, a project that we worked on a collaboration between NG Green and NREL. Um, and this is the same experiment that uh, Thomas Duke presented on at the Work Package 4 workshop uh, last week. Um, so he presented uh, a few different phases of the Smart Eel project, and I'll be going into more detail on the wake steering experiment, um, especially parts that are relevant to uncertainty quantification and, and field validation. Um, so for those who attended the workshop for Work Package 4, a lot of this will be familiar, but I think there'll be um, a lot of new information as well. All right, so an outline of the presentation, give a, an overview of the experiment, uh, talk about some initial data processing steps before really analyzing the data. Um, talk a little bit about the Flores model that we use to compare with the field results, and then the wind direction variability model. So we modified the, the Flores um, energy gain predictions using a wind direction variability model. And I'll spend a little more time on that than I normally would on an overview presentation about the experiment because uh, I think this wind direction variability model is closely related to the, the forward UQ topic within this work package. Um, and then uh, present some of the results. So first looking at the yaw offsets that were achieved to implement wake steering, and then the energy gain um, as a function of wind direction from wake steering. And then finally the reduction in wake losses, which is how we quantify the, the improvement from wake steering using a single metric. Um, so this, this experiment, uh, similar to what uh, Thomas presented last week, we are collaborating with NG Green um, on yeah, a wind farm that they're operating in northern France. And uh, so it's a seven, seven wind turbines in this wind farm, and we're applying uh, yaw misalignments to this upstream turbine uh, called SMV6 and uh, applying misalignments to deflect its wake away from SMV5 about 3.7 rotor diameters downstream. And um, so we had a, a wind cube nacelle LIDAR mounted on the controlled turbine. So we used that to, to uh, verify the yaw offsets were achieved that we were um, using for wake steering. And yeah, so this was about a four month experiment uh, from February to May of 2020. Uh, the experiment actually ran through the summer, but uh, they're just wasn't much useful data during the summer because of the, the wind directions and, and uh, a little bit of maintenance that was going on. And so the wake steering controller, uh, just a quick overview, um, it was based on a, a lookup table. It was a function of wind direction and wind speed. And, um, and so the wind direction was formed by taking the wind vane signal, adding it to the yaw position of the turbine, and then low pass filtering that, also low pass filtering the wind speed, um, and then using them as an input to an offset lookup table uh, to determine the offset as a function of wind speed and wind direction. That offset was then subtracted from the wind vane uh, and then input to the existing yaw controller of the turbine. So by subtracting the yaw offset, we're inducing the, the yaw controller to achieve that offset instead of tracking um, you know, perfect alignment with the wind. Uh, so <clears throat> this is a plot of the target yaw offsets in the lookup table. So we're only using positive yaw offsets um, and limiting them to 20 degrees and, uh, and then re reducing the maximum or reducing the offsets as wind speed increases to help uh, reduce loading impacts. And uh, yeah, I guess just going back to this previous slide, this is showing what a, how we're defining a positive yaw offset. So a counterclockwise rotation of the nacelle relative to the wind direction, 
and this is deflecting the wind uh, in the or deflecting the wake in the clockwise direction away from the downstream turbine. So we're only using one direction of, of offsets uh, because we wanted to avoid the large changes in, in yaw position when switching from negative to positive offsets. Um, to help reduce blade loads, there's been some work that's shown that uh, positive yaw misalignments can reduce certain blade loads and negative yaw misalignments might increase them a little bit. Um, and then if we had to choose one direction of offsets, we, we prefer uh, positive offsets because through high fidelity modeling, we've seen that you can achieve larger power gains using positive yaw misalignments. All right. Uh, so the a little bit about the wind conditions during the experiment from February to May. Um, on the top left plot, this is showing the distribution of um, wind directions that, that uh, we observed during the experiment. And the, the y-axis is the number of one minute samples that were collected. So there's a pretty even distribution of, of wind directions across our range of interest. Um, for wind speeds in the middle plot, uh, surprisingly is pretty heavily weighted towards higher wind speeds from eight to 11 meters per second. And um, we sampled a, a similar distribution of wind speeds with baseline and, and wake steering control. And then on the right plot is the distribution of turbulence intensity. This is measured by a ground-based LIDAR, the, the wind cube. Um, and yeah, we saw a mean turbulence intensity of about 11% during the experiment. Um, the plot on the bottom left is just showing the, the two-dimensional histogram of wind speeds and wind directions, just showing that for almost every wind direction bin, uh, we were collecting data from, from wind speeds from uh, 4 to 13 meters per second. And the bottom right plot is the long-term wind rows. And this is just from, from reanalysis data, and it's just showing that uh, we are, in fact, seeing um, uh, you know, prevailing wind directions from the southwest, which is the direction that our controlled turbine and the wake turbine are aligned. So we, you know, these were chosen to uh, be able to observe a lot of cases where the control turbine is waking that turbine downstream of it. Um, a little bit, I guess I didn't cover, uh, we're toggling between uh, baseline and wake steering control uh, hourly. So we're, yeah, every hour we'll switch to using the um, yep, yeah, to switching to using the, the offsets instead of the, the original wind vane signal. Um, and so that's that's what I mean by uh, baseline and controlled periods in these plots. All right. Um, now a little bit about the data processing steps that we're performing. So first, talking about data filtering. Um, first of all, we're averaging all of the data into one minute averages. Um, this just allows us to uh, to look at average data that you know it averages out the high frequency variations, but it's still a high enough temporal resolution that we can observe changing uh, atmospheric conditions. Um, so we're not averaging too many conditions into a single period. Um, and so before analyzing the data to look at the energy gain from wake steering, we're filtering based on the power curve. And first, we remove periods where derating or curtailment were indicated by status codes. Um, and you can see examples of derating on the top of this power curve where, uh, where the power is just flat for, um, for a wide range of wind speeds. So we would remove those. And then we're removing periods where the wind speed is above 6 meters per second and the power is less than 1% of rated. Um, that's just to make sure we filter out any other cases that weren't indicated by the status codes when the turbine's not operating, but the wind speed's above cut in. And then we're removing any remaining outlier points um, 
using a, a bin filter approach where uh, for for uh, yeah about 50 different bins uh, binned by power we're, we're um, removing outliers that are more than two to three standard deviations from the median wind speed um, so the it's just an illustration of how that bin filter is applied, where we take the, the median wind speed for a given power bin and then remove points that are more than a certain threshold away from that median value. And we're also um, discarding data that is within 10 minutes after a control mode transition. So when we switch from baseline to wake steering or wake steering to baseline, we'll remove the first 10 minutes of data uh, to allow for yaw controller transients. So, um, so the yaw controller is, um, you know, a little, it's slow because it has to wait till enough air accumulates before it starts yawing the turbine. Um, so we just want to allow for that, uh, yeah, for those slow dynamics to adjust to our new yaw offset command. And then we're calibrating the, the wind direction. We have to perform this step um, because the calibration to true north of the, of the turbine nacelle positions um, is not always accurate. So we performed the calibration by um, looking at the, the peak uh, wake deficit between our downstream turbine and upstream turbine as a function of wind direction. Uh, so we find that peak offset and then uh, and then um, measure the offset between that wake deficit and the known direction of alignment between the turbines. And uh, and so we had to apply an offset of about, I think, six degrees or so um, to make the maximum wake deficit direction align with the direction where we know the the maximum. Uh, wake deficit should be. And then we also want to make sure that that calibration does not change during the experiment period. So this plot on the right is just showing the, the difference between the measured in the cell position and the direction from a, a, a GPS compass. And that that difference, as long as it stays constant during the experiment period, then um, then this is a reliable method. And we see that, that that calibration did change before the experiment, but during the experiment period, uh, which is indicated by these vertical gray lines, uh, it did remain as a, a constant um, offset. Okay. All right, so um, then we used reference measurements to compare the power of the uh, of our test turbines, um, SMV6 and SMV5, we compared their power to, uh, to uncontrolled reference turbines or reference turbines that did not have wake steering applied. And so to calculate the reference uh, wind direction for binning and analyzing the data, we took the average wind direction of these four turbines that are circled and then the reference wind speed was also the average wind speed measured by those turbines. And same with the reference power. Um, and then we removed the bias between the reference wind direction and that calibrated wind direction of our controlled turbine. Uh, and then um, applied a correction to the reference wind speed and power values as well. And um, so we basically applied a transfer function so that uh, as a function of wind speed and wind direction bins, we would make sure that the average power or wind speed of the reference turbines matched the average power or wind speed of, of the uh, controlled turbine during baseline control periods. Um, and then applied a, a further correction to the, um, to the reference wind speed so that it would match the free stream wind speed measured by an SL LIDAR um, on average for, um, yeah, when, when binned by uh, wind speed. So a little bit more information on that correction applied to the reference power values. Um, 
this this top plot this is just showing the ratio between the energy production of turbines uh, five and six combined relative to the reference power. And so we would expect that that would converge to a value of one when we're outside of our uh, weight loss region. But here we observed that the energy ratio was exceeding one, it was about 1.15. Um, and so that could influence our, our analysis when we're looking at the impact of wake steering. So we applied a correction so that um, on, on average, we would, uh, our, our reference power values would match the power of our upstream turbine during baseline control periods. Um, and so we we bend the the data by um, by wind speed and wind direction, and then applied a a scaling factor to each of those bins, so that on on average it would match between the the reference turbines and the um, controlled turbine. So the plot on the bottom is showing what this energy ratio looks like after the correction, and now it, it does converge to an energy ratio of one outside of the, the wake region. All right, then for our comparison uh, between our uh, model predictions and field results, we used a, a Floris model. Uh, this was the gauss curl hybrid model. I think we were using uh, Floris version 2.3 or 2.4. It's, it's, it's not the latest version of Floris. Um, and basically tuned, tuned Floris to match the, the average wake losses that were observed and perform this step by just tuning the turbulence intensity parameter. Uh, we found a TI of 11% matched the baseline wake losses pretty well. And, uh, and this also closely agrees with the average turbulence intensity measured by the ground-based LIDAR during the experiment. Um, and then uh, we did verify that the theoretical power curve that was used as um, one of the inputs to Floris matched the, the measured power curve of the turbines very closely. All right. Um, now I'll move on and talk about the, the wind direction variability model. Um, this is, yeah, kind of stepping away from the, from this, um, current field experiment a little bit and just going into the, the theory of this, uh, this model. Um, so these slides are from a different wake steering experiment. Um, this was presented at the NUIA WinTech conference a few years ago. Um, but I thought it would be interesting uh, to talk about this in a little bit of detail since it's closely related to uh, uncertainty quantification. So, so Floris is, uh, you know, a time averaged wake model. So it doesn't, it's not really intended to capture the dynamics of, of, uh, of, of wake steering control. Um, but we have variable wind directions, the wind direction is always changing and the yaw controller has to try to track that wind direction, but it doesn't perfectly track the wind direction. So we're trying to introduce that uh, potential source of error or that um, inability to perfectly track the wind directions into our Flores predictions. Um, so this top plot is showing one minute average yaw position and one minute average wind direction for a, for a wind turbine from a previous wake steering experiment. And of course, they don't always match. And the, the yaw position tends to lag behind the, the wind direction because of the slow controller dynamics. Um, and so we'll always have some 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 yaw misalignment error. The bottom plot is similar, but it's now showing what happens with wake steering, where instead of trying to track the actual wind direction, we're trying to track the the desired yaw position for wake steering, uh, which is a function of wind direction. So similarly, the the turbine's yaw position will lag behind that target yaw position. Um, and then we can characterize the the yaw tracking error um, using the standard deviation of the error between the yaw position and the wind direction. Here we saw a standard deviation of about five degrees. 
Okay. So how can we introduce this, this source of uh, wind direction uh, variability and its impact on yaw tracking ability? How can we introduce this to our, our florist predictions? Well, what we do is we start with um, a, our, uh, our, yaw, our intended yaw position for wake steering as a function of wind direction. So that's indicated by this solid black line on the plot, which is probably a little bit hard to see. Um, but anyways, around 324 degrees, our target yaw position drops by, by 20 degrees because we have a 20 degree offset we're applying. And then by about 350 degrees, we're, we're back to um, uh, zero yaw offset. <clears throat> so ideally for any given wind direction, we would achieve the, the target yaw position that we wanna use for wake steering. Um, but since we have the wind direction variability and the, um, the error in perfectly tracking the wind direction, then we're introducing some probability distribution of the yaw position and the wind direction um, to each of these points on the target yaw offset or the target yaw position curve. So this is an example. Um, let's see. I don't know if you can see the mouse cursor, but here's an example where um, I'm just applying this distribution of uncertainty to a single point on the yaw position curve, and um, it's it's a, a, a two-dimensional normal distribution characterized by the wind direction um, uncertainty and the yaw position uncertainty. So the yaw position uncertainty, this would model how there's some uncertainty in the actual yaw position that will be achieved for a given uh, wind direction. And then the wind direction uncertainty is modeling how once we achieve that yaw position, the wind direction is going to vary uh, before the controller will start yawing again to, to move the turbine. So when the, when the yaw position is fixed, the wind's going to vary um, a little bit until we yaw again. So to introduce this uh, to the entire yaw position, uh, target yaw position curve, we'll take the convolution of that, um, of that probability distribution of uncertainty with this entire target yaw position curve. And we end up with our probability distribution of yaw positions and wind directions. Um, and, uh, and so this is just showing how for any given wind direction, we're not going to always achieve our target yaw position, but there's some distribution of yaw positions that the controller will actually achieve. Uh, and then from this distribution, we can find out what our, what our mean achieved offsets, yaw offsets will be as a function of wind direction. And so to do that, we'll take, um, for each wind direction, we'll just find the, the mean yaw position from this distribution. And then that's plotted on this uh, on these bottom plots compared to our target offset schedule. Um, so, the, so the trends that we always see are that um, we don't quite achieve that maximum target offset during our controlled uh, wind direction sector. And then there's going to be some unintended yaw offsets outside of the, the, the wake steering sector. Um, because sometimes the turbine will still be misaligned with the wind or still have a yaw offset applied and then the wind direction will will change but the controller can't can't um, you know quickly adapt to that <clears throat> so we have these leftover uh, yaw offsets all right and then uh, similarly we can use that distribution of achieved offsets to um, apply this wind direction variability correction to the florist predictions. So because we're not achieving our maximum target yaw offsets, the, um, the achieved florist values or florist predictions of the, the power gain are going to be slightly lower relative to the ideal case. And then we can sometimes observe a slight loss in power outside of this wake steering region because of our unintended yaw offsets that remain all right, so now going back to, to this uh, current experiment we're talking about, um, 
we we're, we're using this model when we're post-processing the results to compare uh, Floris and the, the field data. And so this model is really um, parameterized by the, uh, the standard deviation of the yaw error. And this plot is showing that standard deviation of the yaw misalignment as a function of wind speed. And so we see larger, larger yaw misalignment errors at lower wind speeds and then it kind of levels off at around uh, five degree standard deviation for higher wind speeds. Um, we saw the higher yaw misalignment error at low wind speeds because the wind direction or the winds more turbulent and there's more wind direction variability at lower wind speeds. Um, but also the yaw controller um, had a, a larger uh, dead band at, at lower wind speeds, so it was not reacting to the wind direction changes quite as aggressively at, at low wind speeds. All right, <clears throat> so now back to kind of the main results from the experiment. Uh, first of all, we measured the achieved yaw offsets of our controlled turbine as a function of wind direction. And the plot on the left, this is just all wind speeds combined. And on the right, we have are achieved offsets for different wind speed bins. Um, and so start, there's a lot of different uh, curves shown on this plot, and I'll kind of walk through them. So first we have, uh, with the dash dot uh, curve, we have our, our ideal offsets. This is what the wake steering controller wants to achieve. And then this dotted line, this is the predicted offsets. This is what we predict we'll see as a function of wind direction by including that wind direction variability model. Um, and then um, in these solid lines with the, the shaded regions, these are what we're actually measuring in the field. Uh, so we're, we're first measuring the offsets using the, the wind vane of the turbine um, for baseline and wake steering control periods. And then we're also measuring them using the nacelle LIDAR. So the first thing we notice is that our achieved offsets as a function of wind direction. Um, just like what we predict with the wind direction variability model, they don't reach that maximum target yaw offset. And we also have some unintended yaw offsets that persist outside of the wake steering region. Um, so it you know, doesn't perfectly match what's predicted, but uh, qualitatively it, it, is a, it does closely agree with what we're predicting. Um, and then the next thing I'm noticing here is that the nacelle LIDAR is measuring a, uh, you know, a mean offset of a few degrees when we have baseline control. So that's suggesting that there's a small bias in our wind vane measurements. Um, and then when we look at the achieved offsets as a function of wind speed for these different uh, two meter per second wind speed bins, we can see that that bias between the, the wind vane and the, and the cell LIDAR measured offsets is larger at lower wind speeds. And then um, as wind speed increases, that, that bias decreases. So what we see is there's some wind vane bias and it's it depends on the, the wind speed. Um, so we didn't try to correct this in the experiment, but we just um, measured it and we think it's important to perform that, that you know, calibration of the wind vane um, for, for future experiments. Um, and then as a function of wind speed, uh, you know, at very low wind speeds, four to six meters per second, first of all, there's not very much data at this wind speed bin, so the plots are, are very noisy. Um, and then it just also appears that the turbine is struggling to achieve the, the target yaw offsets at those low wind speeds because of the higher wind direction variability. And then uh, from, yeah, six to 12 meters per second, then we start to see, um, well, especially eight to 12 meters per second, uh, there's a lot less noise in these plots and you can see that the achieved yaw offsets are starting to closely agree with, uh, with what we're predicting. Okay, and so now looking at the energy impact of uh, wake steering during these, this experiment, um, we're using 
a metric called the energy ratio, which has been used in a lot of different um, field campaigns for wake steering. And so, so this is representing the energy produced at our test turbines normalized by the energy of the, the reference turbines. So we have those four reference turbines. We're using the average um, power of those reference turbines for comparison. And um, the, the reason why we're normalizing the power of our test turbines by the reference turbines is we're trying to correct for atmospheric conditions that could be affecting all turbines in the wind farm, like wind shear or different stability classes. So we're trying to isolate just the impact that wake steering might have on the energy production. Um, and then we're using, so yeah, this the second bullet point here is defining the energy ratio. And so this is going to be the weighted sum of the average power of the test turbine over our different one meter per second wind speed bins normalized by the weighted sum of the average power of the reference turbines. And these weights are equal to the total number of samples in the particular wind speed bin for baseline and controlled periods. Um, so we're applying some weights to you know, weight according to the wind speed distribution when coming up with our, our total energy ratio. And we're using the same weights for the baseline and controlled periods. Um, so we're not trying, so we're not introducing any any potential bias there by weighting differently for the different control modes. Um, and so yeah, the the top plot on the right, this is just comparing these energy ratios as a function of wind direction using two degree wind direction bins for the the baseline and controlled periods. Um, and comparing them to our our florist calculations, um, and, and the, you, know, you can see how we tuned the florist model to match the overall wake losses of the, um, of the turbines during baseline control. The bottom plot, this is how we're really quantifying the impact of wake steering, and this is the difference between the energy ratios um, with wake steering and during baseline control. So it's, yeah, just, uh, simply the the energy ratio during controlled periods minus the energy ratio from uh, baseline control periods. So for our upstream and downstream turbines combined, we're seeing uh, an increase in that energy ratio <clears throat> uh, during our main wake steering control region, and that that uh, you know is slightly higher than our our florist predictions. Um, for this case, and then we see a little, you know, possibly a slight uh, loss in energy outside of that wake steering region. Um, although some of this could be just uncertainty in the in the calculations. Uh, so these shaded regions, these are the 95% confidence intervals of our uh, energy ratios and change in energy ratio, and we're quantifying those using bootstrapping. So for each wind direction bin, we're randomly resampling the data that's used to calculate the baseline and controlled energy ratios, uh, randomly resampling them thousands of times. And then um, for each, each sample, we're calculating a new energy ratio. And then from that distribution of energy ratios, we find the 95% confidence interval. And indicating that by the shaded region. Now looking at the energy gain for the individual turbines, um, we have the downstream turbine on the left. So here you can really see the, the significant increase in energy. Um, it's you know, roughly in line with, with what's predicted by Flores, uh, both the ideal Flores predictions and um, our, you know, and I think it's, the, the measured gain is probably between the ideal florist predictions and the florist predictions with the wind direction variability model. Um, and then on the right is the energy ratio for the upstream turbine that's controlled. And you can see that there is a slight loss in power <clears throat> uh, 
when we're applying that yaw misalignment as expected. So, um, yeah, maybe I'll just quickly go over this, but we also analyzed the energy ratio and change in energy ratio for different wind speed bins. We saw very large gains in energy at uh, the lowest wind speed bin, four to six meters per second, but also a lot of uncertainty in those values because we didn't have much data. Uh, six to eight meters per second, we really didn't see much, much of a change in that energy ratio, um, whereas Flores was predicting a significant increase in energy. Um, so we think this is because there's just a lot of wind direction variability, um, so it's difficult for the for the controller to achieve the target yaw offsets, and we have higher turbulence at, at these lower wind speeds, so that could affect the energy increase as well. Um, and then for eight to eight to ten and ten to twelve meter per second bins, we did see a pretty significant increase. Um, of course, with some some noise in the results, uh, but these are the wind speed bins where we think wake steering is really most successful from this experiment. Uh, 12 to 14 meters per second, we really did not apply a very high yaw offset, so we weren't expecting much gain. And uh, you know we're observing some losses, some gains, but on average, there's not much of an impact uh, for that highest wind speed bin. And then looking at just the downstream and the upstream turbines, um, for the downstream turbine, we can see that that large energy gain uh, for the four to six meter per second bin. And then it's pretty obvious at the eight to 10 and 10 to 12 meter per second bins. Um, and then, yeah, mixed results for the six to eight meter per second bin. So these large gains are then um, you know, somehow balanced by the power loss on the upstream turbine. So for the six to eight and eight to 10 meter per second bins on the right, you can see that that clear power loss uh, from Yamas alignment. Um, and then we were happy to see that at the higher wind speed starting at 10 meters per second, you really can't uh, observe much of a power loss from wake steering because the turbine is ap approaching uh, rated wind speed. And so the um, the power is just not as sensitive to the yaw misalignment anymore. Um, one thing that was surprising is we still saw an increase in energy at the upstream turbine at that lowest wind speed bin, um, which can be contributing to our overall large energy gain that we observed for the combined turbines in that wind speed bin. Um, so we think there might be something else that's causing that change in energy, that increase in energy, even when the turbine's misaligned uh, for the lowest wind speed bin, could just be a lack of data. Obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty in, um, in the estimates for this lowest wind speed bin. All right, so just a couple more slides. Um, I did want to mention that the, the previous plots were showing the energy gain just during the uh, four month experiment period using the data that were collected. And then we applied a, a long term correction um, to the energy gain using the, the wind rose frequencies from this, uh, you know, long term wind rose based on reanalysis data. So the only change that we made here is for our energy ratio calculations for the weights, instead of using the frequencies during the experiment period. We're replacing those weights by the frequencies from the long term wind rows. Um, and so we're comparing the energy gain for the combined turbines on the left during the experiment period with the long term corrected energy ratios on the right. And, uh, you know, the, the general trends still remain. However, we do see that the, the peak energy gain is reduced slightly, and also the peak losses in energy are. Uh, that the, the magnitude is reduced a little bit. Um, and then we are quantifying the overall impact of wake steering on energy production by looking at how much the wake losses are reduced by wake steering. Um, <clears throat> and so for this calculation, we're calculating the wake losses by taking 
the weighted sum of the difference between the, the mean power of the reference and test turbines for each wind direction and wind speed bin. So the power, the, the reference power should represent the, the free stream uh, power production of the turbines uh, without wake losses. So we're subtracting the actual observed power production of our test turbines from that reference power um, for each wind direction and wind speed bin, and then applying weights that are equal to the total number of samples in that wind speed and wind direction bin. So we'll find that we'll, we'll take the sum of the difference between the reference and test power, and then uh, normalize that by the sum of the um, power of just the reference turbine. So this will give us a percent wake loss value. And then we'll, we quantify the reduction in wake losses as the percentage change between the wake losses with baseline control and um, wake steering control. All right, so um, I'm not plotting the, uh, you know, these are just the same energy ratio plots, but above the plots I'm showing the total wake loss reduction values that we calculated. So we saw about a 5.7% reduction in wake losses during the experiment period. After the long-term correction, that was closer to 10%. Um, and then we're quantifying uncertainty in these values using bootstrapping once again. Um, but here we're randomly resampling with replacement all of the data that's used in the calculation for the baseline and controlled periods. Um, rather than applying bootstrapping to each wind direction bin independently. So what we see is there's there's very large uncertainty in, in the wake loss reduction values. Um, so for the during the experiment period, that 95% confidence interval was from you know a slight loss in power up to an 11.5% reduction in wake losses. And then for the long-term corrected, um, once again, yeah, about 2% to 16%. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, there's obviously a lot of uncertainty in these um, values, which hopefully we can find ways to reduce that uncertainty, uh, perhaps through this work package. So a few quick conclusions. Um, you know, we observed that wake steering was successful and that we saw that increase in the energy ratio for the upstream and downstream turbines combined, and estimated a wake loss reduction of about 5.7% for the wind directions we looked at, uh, but there was large uncertainty. And then there was a strong wind speed dependence on the energy gains. So large gains near, near cut-in wind speed, four to six meters per second. It's possible we are seeing um, a large increase in energy because wake steering was preventing that downstream turbine from shutting down sometimes. So the, the relative change in energy can be very high. Um, but again, it, it was surprising to see that that energy gain was also observed on the upstream turbine. So um, probably there's just a lot of uncertainty in those results for the low wind speeds. Six to eight meters per second, we didn't really see much impact on energy, energy production from wake steering. Um, because there's higher wind direction variability, and also there's a lot of power loss from yaw misalignment in, in, at those uh, region two wind speeds. Um, but we did see very large gains from eight to 12 meters per second. So there's, the wind is less turbulent, there's less wind direction variability, and we saw there was uh, less power loss from yaw misalignment on the upstream turbine. Uh, and then the last point, just highlighting that uh, we can combine our, our static or our steady state uh, forest predictions with this wind direction variability model to, uh, to predict what our achieved offsets will be and what the actual energy gains will be um, during the wake steering experiment. Okay, so thanks for your attention. Well, that was a pretty long presentation, um, but Happy to answer any questions. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, so feel free to raise your hand or enter a question in the chat. I see the arena has a question. 
Yeah, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, many thanks for, uh, for the presentation. It was uh, uh, very interesting and in-depth. Uh, probably I missed it. Um, when when you're taking into account in the measurement uh, the 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 job offset, uh, do you filter or take into account if uh, there is a variation provided by the lookup table controller uh, in the samples? I mean, uh, if uh, this may affect the uncertainty you may find in the results that the job is moving. Not because you are changing from baseline to control, to control, but uh, that you're moving from one job offset uh, to another because the wind direction has changed. Uh, this was my my first uh, question, and second question, um, you were analyzing on how to quantify the uncertainty uh, with respect, for example, uh, to to wind speed. Have you found other factors that may affect uh, such uh, quantification? Thank you. Yeah, um, so. Yeah, thanks for the question. So the first question. Um, I think this might be the best slide to show what. Um, yeah, what you're talking about, but. So I'm plotting the. The. Yeah, the ideal or target offsets as a function of wind direction. Um, but you're saying that yeah, during during each one minute averaging period, the target offset could change because the wind direction is changing. Um, so yeah, I mean that's not you know, we didn't really like apply any correction or do anything special to try to account for that in the analysis. Um, but the um, yeah, I don't know th this plot of the target offsets, the ideal offsets. This is just based on the. The lookup table from the average wind speed and direction during that one minute period. Um, so it's it's not factoring in that the. Target offset could change. Um, and then we're just simply plotting the the average. Achieved the offset during that one minute period. So for some of these, it, it could be averaging. Um, or that the averaging period could include a, a, a yaw transition. Um, so, so I guess, uh, yeah, yeah, these results do include these transient periods when, when the turbine's actively yawing. Um, and how often was the job set uh, updated? The well, the the job position uh, from the controller. Right. I don't. I don't know exactly, but I, I would say like maybe every five minutes on average. Maybe three to three to five minutes. Um, when there's you know a sudden change in the target offset from zero to 20 degrees, then the controller reacts a little bit faster because it sees that large error. Um, but yeah, on, the turbine's only going to yaw every few minutes. And then you're Second question about uh, yeah, different sources of uncertainty in the florist predictions. Um, so we included a, the the impact of wind direction variability, but we did not add any uh, wind speed variability model or um, or anything else like that. Um, we think that the variability in wind direction is the most important factor to include. So that's why we focused on that. But I think that wind speed, uh, you know, should be considered as well. Well, I was mostly saying regarding the the not the Floris uh, computation uh, with uncertainty, but when you were showing the, I think it was from another experiment, the the yellow errors that uh, you may find and how they de were dependent on the wind. Speed that the the bias was different depending on the wind speed, and I just was wondering if uh, it also depends on other factors or if you had uh, found any other factors. M maybe I'm 
I mislead with some of the other graphs, but the. Uh... Oh, no, it's. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, so could you, is, is this a good slide to show? Yeah, it was uh, regarding those uh, data and uh, uh, you were talking about uh, how this was uh, affected by wind speed. And I was wondering if you had analyzed any other possible factors uh, that may have impact on that as well. Um, no, so in this case, we did not. Um, I think maybe this is, yeah, this might be where you're referring to how we looked at the yaw error as a function of wind speed. Um, right, so that's, yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that at these lower wind speeds, it's not really the wind speed necessarily that's having the impact, but there's higher turbulence at the lower wind speeds, which increases the yaw misalignment or the, the standard deviation of the yaw misalignment. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, perhaps it would be more fair to, to plot this as a function of turbulence intensity um, or something like that. Okay, okay. Right. <laughs> yep, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so don't have much time, but uh, I saw that Torben, you had a question. Uh, yeah, uh, it's kind of along the same lines, I guess. Uh, uh, you were modeling this uncertainty in the uh, wind direction and <coughs> and your uh, or your reference error, you could say, as uh, independent Gaussian uh, variables in flourish, I guess. Right. Uh, and I was thinking, why independent and maybe also the the, the your this alignment control and the, the your speed would have an effect. So uh, for some, uh, your speeds are, are uh, limits in your speed. You could have maybe things, uh, these two errors going out of phase. And if the, it was faster, they could be in phase and, and so on. Um, is that something you, uh, you have been thinking about? Yeah, um, thinking about certainly, um, but haven't haven't tried to include that in the model yet. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, just simplified this by assuming independent uncertainty in wind direction and yaw. But I, I do think that right as the winds as the wind direction increases, then in in one direction, then um, you're you know, distribution of, of yaw offsets or of yaw positions that you'll achieve probably depends on that. Um, so it's probably not completely fair to to treat those as independent. No, it, yeah, it was just kind of a general uh, from uh, experience of uh, control systems. I mean, uh, and disturbances. It's not unnormal that that uh, that the following is a bit out of phase. Uh, uh, and it can be uh, more or less, uh, and and I was just thinking that that might be important. Mm. Yeah, but but uh, thank you for for a good presentation. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks thanks for that comment. Um, and and yeah, like we we think that as as the controller um, is faster at. at at adjusting its yaw position and tracking the wind direction, then that would um, reduce this uncertainty quite a bit. Um, but yeah, that's that's really just you know further research we need to do to try to better model this um, without using that independent uh, assumption for the yaw and wind direction uncertainty. All right. Uh, I think that uh, there was a question from um, all right, well, 
trying to scroll through the chat, but I, I did see that uh, Michael Howland, you had a question. Are you still on the call? Sorry, I'm still muted. Uh, I was talking. okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, of course, always doing that. Um, yeah, I know we're running out of time, so uh, and I want to leave some time for for also the questions in the chat. But I did want to just ask something briefly, and then also we we can also talk more more about these these themes because uh, this is a great presentation. Uh, learned a lot and and very interesting work. So um, yeah, my my high level question is with respect to the the final energy gain results you had where you showed that the the benefit was primarily for wind speeds between 8 and 10 meters per second. Is that right? Um, and there was less benefit uh, for 6 to 8 meters per second. And, and just at a high level, I suppose that's a somewhat counterintuitive result in the sense that at 6 to 8 meters per second, the turbine, turbine thrust is higher. It's uh, directly within Region 2 operation. So... Um, and I know you hinted at some of the, the points as to why you think this might be the case, but it would be, be good to hear more of your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and that was counterintuitive for us as well. Uh, we always thought that wake steering was more of a uh, like region two um, technology when, when thrust and CP is maximized. Um, because with that higher thrust, then you know, there's more, you have a higher, a greater ability to to deflect the wake through wake steering. Um, but yeah, what you know, the main thing we observed is that there's that larger wind direction variability at, at lower wind speeds. So um, in in steady state, maybe wake steering would show the most benefit there. But uh, there's just it's harder for the yacht controller to track the, the changing wind directions. Um, so I think that's contributing a lot. There's also higher turbulence at the lower wind speeds. So wake steering is going to be less effective with higher turbulence. Um, and then, yeah, we, we did see that um, larger loss in energy from wake steering in, in region two as well. Um, so Great. yeah, I think yeah, it's a, yeah, it's very a interesting. combination so I guess, of factors. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess in terms of the effect on the downwind turbine, the effects that you mentioned, the higher variability, the higher turbulence uh, effects at the lower wind speed, I guess these can be characterized to some extent as site specific. Uh, there may right. be sites that have higher turbulence intensity correlated with higher wind speeds and so on. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting to what extent it's a site-specific wind characteristic problem versus inherent to to a, a active wake steering. Yeah. So if this was applied offshore with lower turbulence, then these results could change considerably. Um, and and also, you know, it's not just site-specific, but somewhat turbine-specific in that the yacht controller for these turbines below seven meters per second, it uh, you know, track the wind a lot, um, a lot less accurately than it wind speeds above seven meters per second. Uh, so I think that that played an important role in the variations with wind speed that we're seeing too. Great, thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, and then just a comment from or a question from. Uh, Sorry, how do you... Oh, okay, that was, um, yeah, a question from Carlo about if we were using the LiDAR directly in the, um, as part of the controller, but in fact, we were just using the measurements from the wind vane as in the input to the wake steering controller and the LiDAR was used for analyzing the results later, um, specifically to see how accurately the wind vane was was measuring the the true Yamas alignment. And I think that's about it. Looks like there was another question uh, from Stoyan Kenev who had to leave. Um, yeah, so. Thanks for uh, your attention and for 
sticking around uh, for a few extra minutes. 